de Global Latin Factor Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Global Latin Factor Podcast, where we talk about Latino everything. Yes, if you're a Latino and you're a little bit lost as far as your culture, you've been wondering about some Latino and you really know where to look at. You found the perfect place. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. We record off of Fishbowl Radio Network and right here at the Choctaw Studios, recently named, renamed Choctaw Studios. And no, Choctaw Stadium. Choctaw Stadium. It was Globe Live Stadium. That's right. At the Fishbowl Studios. Absolutely. There and today, go. a very, very special day. <laughs> she done what she does because she's a professional. We have Sammy St. John Martinez, a.k.a. Sammy G. She is the owner of Fishbowl Radio Network. They've been in business for 12 years. One of the first internet radio stations online. She's an entrepreneur. 30 years radio, terrestrial radio 40. veteran. 40 years terrestrial yes. radio veteran. So, yeah. And one of the first <laughs> Latinas in the DFW forward area an on-air personality, Miss Sammy G. Hola. Hola. How you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for inviting me on your show. I'm excited. I appreciate the last minute uh, layup and uh, assistance. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I was wondering why I hadn't been asked to be on your show. Very improv. I, I've been thinking about it too. So I'm just a fill-in. But I wanted to make sure that I was up to par <laughs> and got, you know, back in the radio, back in the in the groove, back in the fishbowl, swimming nicely. I felt comfortable, even though I don't know how to swim. And then I was able to, like, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you, which I, I'm not able to. 40 years of experience is way too much for you me. You can go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Um, but at least I can uh, do better, a better job for you this time. All right. Let's do so, it. So, okay. First segment we're going to do is called Preguntas al Chile. I know it sounds Ooh. a little little vulgar, but all it means is <laughs> it's an expression that we say Latinos, some Latinos, Mexicanos, that is straight to the point. Tacos o tortas? Tacos. Corn tortilla, flour tortilla. Flour. Gorditas, sopes. Sopas. Mexican coca or jarrito. Jarrito. Horchata, jamaica, or tamarindo Orchata. agua. Oh, look at her. Salsa verde, salsa roja. My husband's salsa verde. Menudo, pozole. My husband's menudo. Okay, why your salsa verde? What's so special about My salsa? husband's salsa verde, uh -huh. which was his mother's recipe. Mm. I'm not kidding you. People call us for it they've told him he needs to go into business for it like this salsa i have never tasted a salsa like that when we share it with people that come over to eat they're like i want some of this is it like a something special like a, i mean i don't want you to if it's his family secret he's gonna go into business well i, don't I mean ruin i've it. never made it i don't cook very much so i don't even know what's in it my daughters learned to make it mm. uh but he he says it's the love he puts in it. But there's something that is just so different about it that right. people really ask. I'm not just saying this. Like, they ask us so. Sometimes for Christmas, we'll give that as gifts. In jars, we make a lot because people want it. Wow. And so, you know, he makes it fresh. And I think, it I is think, so good. I think some of the most successful restaurants mm -hmm. the cooks cook with love yes and that's the reason why it's different than every other place yes so i think that's why he says his it but i'm i'm just saying like oh my god and then menudo is the same the same his mom's recipe and they kind of have a little competition in his family of who can make the best menudo from his mom's recipe from back in the day may she rest in peace mm -hmm. but uh Gosh, that menudo! I have to say, of all the siblings that I've tasted the menudos, his is the best. Do they? Do he use hominy on his recipe? Yes. Okay, because there's people that call it pancita, right? Which is the same thing as menudo, and people call it menudo. Yes. Here. And right. another thing, where I come from, El Paso, Texas, mm -hmm. we eat it with bolillos. Yes. And then when I moved here tostada. to the Dallas, Texas, it was they eat it with tortilla. Tortilla tostada. Yes. I, 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 when I started, when I first, when I used to eat it, when I first got here to the state when I was 11, back in 1993, right. I used to eat it with tostadas. Okay. Just a tostada right. with a little salt on it. Okay. That's so how we used to eat it. We, we, we eat it with the bolillo, with mm -hmm. butter, and we, we heat them up in the oven to where that it's outside, it's crispy, yeah. with the menudo. Oh, yeah. And it's getting that season where it's cold, like he makes it more in the fall and the winter. Perfect. So I can't wait. Now you got me craving it. <laughs> now I'm going to ask well, him to make it this weekend. I think the temperature is going to drop soon. So here you go. Churros or flan? Flan. I don't know. If no, you're... no, no. Churro. I don't know. I like Oh, both. that was hard. Which one? Uh, churros or flan? Churros or flan? Okay. Uh, I don't know if you drink beer or not. Corona, Dos Equis, Modelo or Victoria? Dos Equis. Tequila or mezcal? Uh, tequila. 
Okay. Mazapan o Duvalin? The candies. Mazapan. I love mazapan. Valentia, Valentina, Tapatio o Cholula sauce? Hot sauce. Ah, uh, Cholula. Okay, so the conchas. They're different colors. I don't know if the flavor is different, but do you like the brown ones, the white ones, or the pink ones? The conchas. Oh, definitely the chocolate ones. Don't the, they taste like chocolate? Yes. Uh, I call we, we them chocolate, baiting. vanilla, and strawberry. We were, with the baiting, I think, I don't know how much... I know for sure the chocolate ones have a, a different flavor. Than yeah, all they the put other the ones. cocoa in them when they make is them, and then the is? vanilla they put vanilla and the strawberry they See, put strawberry. I'm learning something because last time I had a, a young group and we were having a discussion if they did have flavors, and they I do. thought they did. Yeah, it's chocolate, but... vanilla, and strawberry. My favorite is chocolate, second vanilla, and then last strawberry. All righty, uh, margarita or sal on your on your margarita. You like I like sugar? a frozen margarita with do sal. You like sugar or sal? Sal. Okay, and the last one. Refried beans or borracho beans? Borracho beans. Okay, so I know for a fact, because I've seen plenty of your interviews, and plenty of times you've been interviewed before, and I'm pretty sure you had many other, probably in the thousands. Do you think you've been interviewed about thousands? No, I, maybe the so? hundred. In the Close hundreds? to, though. No, not 40 thousands. 40 years? Yeah, but not thousands. No way. Yeah. It hasn't been that. No, not How thousands. How many shows have been here? No way that it's not getting close to a thousand Well, interviews. yeah, but not me personally, where they've uh -huh. interviewed me? Yes. No, I'm not. Okay, hundreds. what about combined people you interview and times you've been interviewed? Oh, yeah. The the oh, yeah, lots. Anyway, yes. so it has happened that you got up there to the thousands. But one question that I really wanted to ask you, because I feel like an interview is a lot catered to the person that's here. And again, I do appreciate it. And even though it's last minute, you're a very 40 year professional that you know what you're doing. But I'm always curious to know. Of all the times you've been interviewed, three questions that you wish they would have asked this entire time that you've been interviewed before, what would that be? One of them. So one of them is how has my Latino culture affected my career in broadcasting and as an entrepreneur? Okay. So no one's ever asked me that. Okay. So tell me, how has it, has it happened? So basically, so wait, you're doing the interview, but you're making me come up with the questions. Kind of. You're, it's a little trickery, but you know. Wait a minute. If y'all don't know about this, you should you have know. been doing the work. But see, I see how he flips that onto the guest to do the work. I could ask a million and one questions, but it wouldn't touch you the same way if it was something that you wish they would ask. All before. right. Well, like I said, mm -hmm. no one's ever asked me how my Latino culture has affected my career and my business and how it's affected my career. I'll start there. Um, when I first started in radio, I didn't go into Spanish language radio. I went into, you know, what they call secular English radio. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of women and there wasn't a lot of Latinas, especially. Are you the first Latina ever? Because so I'm that the mentioned. first Latina on an English radio station here in the Dallas in the Fort Worth area. area. Yes. For sure. Yes. Okay. Now, in El Paso, it's different because we're a 90% population of Latinas. So th that was normal. Yes. When I came to Dallas in 1989, there was no Latina on the radio that was Latina on an English station. They were on the mm. Spanish language stations, oh, yeah. but they weren't on the English radio stations. So I'm also the first Latina that's done a morning show on an uh, English radio station here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. The first so, one. So, yes, the first one. So, I, I mean, in that sense, I believe it was an advantage. It opened a door, right? Because mm -hmm. um, maybe that's what they were looking for, to try to get that audience. They knew the population was growing so much right. that they had to have someone to appeal to that audience. So I think it was an advantage that I was Latina to mm -hmm. get that break, right? I was there at the right time, at the right place in, in the world, right? Right. So more and more English radio stations knew that in order to get the number one ratings, they needed to go for that Latino population as well. Just Absolutely. like kind of when people are voting for politics, they yes. need that Latino vote. Oh, so yes. the same thing. So that that's how it affected my career in a positive way. What about the barriers? Do uh, you have any barriers being a Latina, knowing that there, you, I mean, it's, you kind of can see that you're a Latina, but kind of can see you might be, I don't know, maybe Italian a little bit. Really? I don't, I don't know. I've no? Been, no. I mean, but, I've been told, you know, like, you know, white, like, Italian, whatever. You're a lighter skin Latina. Yes. It's only obvious. Yes. But any barriers at that time? No. not For me, no. I've heard many people say that they had barriers as a female back in the day because there wasn't very many as a, you know, whatever their race is or whatever. But I've always told people that because of the way I was raised by my parents, right. they didn't socialize me to think that there to think about those things. So I think because I didn't put them in my head or mind, mm -hmm. I never carried that 
barrier with me or made it an obstacle. I was just like, I can do it. This is what I want to do. I want to do it. I was fearless in that sense. I didn't start thinking like, well, maybe I can't because, you know, I'm a woman or maybe I can't because I'm Latina. Right. I, I didn't I didn't have those things in me. I just mm-hmm. went for it, you right. know. And I think sometimes if people put those barriers on themselves, they kind of block themselves from what, those opportunities. It's important what you said, though, because not only the mental part, but not to mention the fact that your parents from small already started putting it in your mind. Yes. That, that wasn't going to be something. That's right. That it's all mental. It is it's mental. It's all mental. Because let's, let's say they did, like, you would grow up to be scared or... or Insecure. You know, things like that. Right. They got a couple of ideas. Just the idea growing in your head that if you go out there, it's going to be hard because yes. you're a female, this and that. But they erase that completely out of your mind. Completely. And you went in without no fear whatsoever. Because, exactly. And if so happened to be that something came up, I'm pretty sure you'd be like, not, not important. Well, because I, I already think, know what I want. I think that helps you have that confidence Absolutely. because you're like, why not me? You know, I never thought of why not me because I'm a woman or why not me because I'm Latina. That didn't come into me. You know, why yeah. not me? Yeah. Like, I'm just as capable as anybody else. So Absolutely. those things weren't in me. So in that yeah. sense, it was great for me in my opportunity as an entrepreneur, uh, being Latina, you know, nobody's ever asked me, how do I bring that culture in? A lot of times as Latinos, we have cultural things that we do that maybe other people in other races don't understand. And for us, we're going like, oh, that's not right. So I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. Like as a Latina, and, and I've had other conversations with people here that are Latina or Latina, we're taught <laughs> where there's a saying, my mom used to say, no seas ranchera. When you walk into a room, you oh, greet yes. everybody. When you leave, you better say bye to everybody. <laughs> yeah. And that's every single time. Do you get what I'm yep, talking about? Right? It's like falta de educación. I mean, that's it. I Meaning you don't have no education if you don't do that when you enter and when you leave. And when you leave. That's and, like this yeah, Latino thing, Latin thing. thing. So when people come into Fishbowl, right, because that's how I was raised, that's a Latino thing that's in me and my culture. I'm like, dang, they didn't even say hi or dang, they didn't even say bye. Like, I see it as something rude when maybe it's not. It's just not the way their culture is because that's a very important thing in our culture that we're brought up with. Oh, yeah. And so that's just an example of how my Latino culture, some of those things that we're raised with infiltrates into your everyday business. Yeah, because even uh, there's another saying you say, whenever you don't say good morning, like, ¿qué dormimos juntos o qué? Right, you know, like, right. But a, a translation for, like, let's say, like, falta de educación would be lack of manners. Yes. Because you're kind of being, like you said, rude. Rude. We see it as rude. rude. We, I do see it. I'm like, okay, what's wrong right. with this person? Right, right. But other people don't. I remember my son's girlfriend. She's, you know, white. Mm-hmm. And she, when she first came over, it was like, wait, you have to say hi to everybody when you get in and then say bye to everybody? There could be 20, 30 people there at an event, like a baptism or a baby shower i said yeah everybody so it's funny because now when she'll meet us at a restaurant or, or anywhere yeah. like she might be at our house in the morning she greets us uh-huh. she greets us then like two hours later we're gonna meet at a restaurant she greets us she greets us because she's like that's, yeah she goes you mean even <laughs> if so i see you multiple you times a day throughout the day like at yeah. different places we got to do that i go yep that's the way it is in the yeah. latino culture i think the american way it infiltrated on me now because i don't do it as much as i used to especially when i go into like a family party and there's other f- people that i don't know our family maybe yes and but everybody's like hey hola como están todos how you doing right and that's it right like, and sometimes you want to sneak out yeah <laughs> <laughs> but not if you, you can't, because yeah. then everybody be, ay, no tiene educación. True, you know yeah. what I mean? That's and how we We, we were value raised. that so much. We really do have a, a thing about it that we really want to feel like we're doing the right thing yes. in that manner. Yes. Okay. Another thing that you said that I liked is the fact that um, besides the fact that you didn't have no barriers, then you were determined. When did the, uh, the, the radio part came to be? Is that something that just grew out of nowhere? So, no, I always knew since I was little. That was another thing my parents, they mm-hmm. always would ask us since we were little. I'm talking four or five, six. You know, what do you love? What do you want to do? What do you enjoy doing? And I always knew that it was something where I could use my voice, like mm-hmm. stand up in front of a classroom and be a teacher. Right. Uh Public speaking, uh, radio, a news anchor woman. Like I always had that in me. So I would always express those kinds of things. Right. So from the moment that me and my siblings would express what, what it is that we wanted to do or that we liked, because they would always constantly ask us, mm-hmm. then they would 
support us by putting us into classes or situations where we were going to be able to hone those skills. Right. Does that make sense? Well, I remember that you because I've seen pictures of you. Of, uh, you were a lot of into, uh, into athletics. Yes. And then eventually you changed from runner. You were a runner. Yeah. Long well, I've always runner. done both. Okay. I was really into athletics from the age of 7 to 30. I competed. Uh, and then I was always into also, again, the public speaking, the oratory, the theater, all that. I did that, too, while I was doing all that. Do you felt that it went one on one with have being able to run, have the stamina, and then help you in the radio? Because you do need to have like you know a certain amount of like voice and and like stamina in your voice, your uh-huh. like your your lungs, your lungs to be yeah. able to to do what you do. Yeah, definitely as like a vocal artist because I do voiceover work for commercials. Yes, you always have to build your lungs. I the people I teach voiceover now, I tell them you have to do cardio cardio work because yeah. you have to build your lungs because you might read an audio book or, or a script and it requires that lung capacity. So in that sense, but I think more the sports also help me that radio is very competitive. Mm. So I was already a competitor. So when I got into radio, it's very competitive. So that was not so a, off to the race. As soon as yeah, you that was not a thing for me. Like, let's go, baby. <laughs> I want to compete. You know what That's I mean? Cool. What about question number two that you wish they would have asked you at other interviews? What would so that I wish they would have asked me, what sacrifices did you have to make in this field? Okay. So everybody sees the 40 years plus, the 12 years with a company now that you have, like the Instagram picture that everybody sees now that you made it. Yes. But nobody sees everything else that you have to, like, nights that you wanted to go out that you couldn't go out. Right. And things like that. So tell me, what was those what were the sacrifices that you made? Well, the biggest sacrifices when I was younger, before I was married and have kids, was that I had to, for instance, my very first radio job, I started at the bottom. It mm-hmm. was an overnight job from midnight to six. And then I went to school, full-time college, and my first class started at eight in the morning. Oh, wow. So that was a sacrifice. Like, I didn't sleep much back then. So, you know, I didn't get to, you know, it was work. And then it was go to college and then it was try to get some rest and it was go back to work. So Mm -hmm. I missed out on a lot of the college life stuff, like going to football games or parties or all those things. I didn't do that because I started really early in my career. So right then I, you know, got into my career. So it was work and and school, work and school, work. What kind of jobs were you doing at that time? What do you mean? Like work. Like work wise. That's what I'm saying. My overnight shift in the radio station. Okay, so you were already in the Yeah, I was 17 years old when I got my first radio job. That's why when I say I've been 40 years, I'm 57. Okay, so so how did that come about? How did you just walk into a place 17 years old? I didn't walk in. I didn't walk in. What happened was I was in school, I was studying uh, communications. That was my degree. Mm -hmm. And I go into one of my classes one day. It was law, broadcasting law. And the lady that was teaching it, she was an ex uh, television anchor woman from mm. some town, and she was the instructor. Right. So, she, you know, the class was over, and she pulled me aside, and she goes, "Hey, Sammy, I got a notice that uh, on this job board that they're hiring some radio DJs at this radio station called Power One Hundred Two. It's here in El Paso. They're going to start." And um, they're bringing a lot of the people from California because the owner of the business of the radio station was from California. They're bringing some radio, but they want one person that's local. It's the it's the bottom shift. Yeah, it's midnight yeah. to six. Um, and I think you should go audition. I think you should go try out for it. And I was like, radio? I, I don't even really like I had never bought a record like my my siblings were into that. But I mean, I like music, but yeah, I wasn't like, course. wow, you know how some people love mm-hmm. music. I was like, OK. <laughs> I was like, why? I said, not radio. I said, I want to be an anchor woman. I want yeah, to be on absolutely. TV. And she was like, yeah, but they also own TV stations. So that's a good way to break in, uh. get some experience, and then go to TV. And I said, okay. So I went, I called, I set up an interview. Then um, they told me that they wanted me to come in at, in the overnight to audition because nobody would be listening to right. audition. And I said, okay. So I didn't know any of the tech because the technical boards and everything at the station were nothing like at the college where we were practicing. 
So y'all practice. Usually colleges practice with like years. Yeah, we were years practicing behind. with the record with the vinyl. <laughs> this was now cards and stuff. And I oh, was yeah. like, oh, my God. So I said, I'm like, what am I going to do? I don't know. But I didn't act like it, right? Mm-hmm. I Again, fearless. Confidence. Yeah, just well, fearless. And I yeah. said, I said, can I come in a few hours early to watch the DJ before just to kind of see what I got to do? The talking part I knew I had down. Oh, yeah. It was the technical part. Mm-hmm. So I came in a few hours early, like at nine, sat in on the show. You know, and, and, and watched, and, and he talked to me and showed me what, buttons, this, whatever. I wrote notes. By midnight came. I did the audition. Went home, went to sleep, got up the next day, went to school, and then I had a call, and they said, you got it. Oh, wow. So so they weren't doing demos at that time either. That was live auditions. That was a live audition. Wow. Yeah, that was a live audition. And you were able to manage to learn all that? Just by writing notes? Yeah. In reality, Very you see impressive. this big... Well, no, it's not that impressive. Well, there's okay? a couple of buttons only. Of all those buttons... Right, you only, only use like, like three. Right, right. <laughs> right. So right? it wasn't that hard. Yeah, you have your not. microphone. You have your three car machines. So one, two, three, four. The telephone. Yeah, five. But still, so, though, the overwhelming sensation just looking at so yeah. many buttons. And that's why you go in there and you see all these buttons and you're like freaking out. But then, you know, I went in early, like I said, and, and he was like, you just need these and these. And they're all labeled. So, OK, it's not that difficult. You know yeah. what I mean? It wasn't that hard. It's five buttons. And you kept that going till when? So I started doing that. And within six months, I was like, OK, this is getting really hard to work from midnight to six, go to school, full load. Wow. I'm not sleeping. I'm like, I don't know. I can handle this. So you know what? I don't think I'm going to I think I'm going to quit because this is just too much. Mm-hmm. And but I was loving it. I was mm-hmm. enjoying it. I didn't think I would get that much love and enjoyment out of radio. I was How loving far- it. When you started doing the gig, all of a sudden you felt that love part. Immediately. 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 Hmm. It was so much fun. I loved it. <laughs> so I was like, oh, my God. I go, but I, but I can't handle the, sco- the schedule, but right. I'm not going to quit school. Absolutely. And so I'm going to quit. I think I'm going to give him my two weeks notice. As I was processing this and thinking I'm about to give him my two weeks notice is I get a call from a station and a gentleman named Raymond Mesa. He's uh, actually an anchor man in California, Los Angeles for one of the Spanish language stations. To this day? To this day. Oh, wow. So you can, you can look him up on Facebook, Raymond Mesa. But Raymond Mesa uh, called me and he said hey and he was the competition for this station mm. at a station called 93z he was the program director and he goes hey we've heard you we, we we'd love to offer you a job at 93z and i was like okay what what time and they said we want you to be the midday girl from 10 to 2 perfect and i was like okay my semester's about to finish uh, now I can schedule my school around that. And that's, that's more like a human life. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I more did More exposure, that. too, is during the day. Oh, yeah. So within six months, boom. From the first time I went to that audition for that first radio show, mm-hmm. I never had to look for a job after that in radio. They would call me and, call and then offer me a job. So that's when I knew this is my purpose. God is putting all the pieces together. You know what I mean? Like, he yeah. wants me to do this. He's not letting me quit. You know you what know? they say that you're like at your breaking point? You just got to keep it going just yes. a little further because you were just about to be yes. like, that's it. I but have six to... months is pretty small, is. you know, but, but I still, could, it was my okay, breaking point. How many point. hours of sleep were you getting? Though? Not much. Exactly. Not much. And you need sleep during yes. this time that you're developing and everything, you know? Yes. So maybe to you it was only six months, but literally just sleeping a little bit more probably felt like, and especially when times are going hard, yes. time seems to be felt like it's longer yes it so was you might have felt like it's six months but it could have been like five years yeah you know? it felt it was total. rough it was rough dude okay. i was just like you know so i remember falling asleep at the couches at the at the uh university in the union where they you know oh, you go eat i yeah. would just like take naps i would fall asleep you know and just it was it was a lot of lack of sleep but then i got this other job perfect schedule perfect time i started there and yeah, it was awesome. So it, the six month job at night, you were getting paid. They were paying. Uh huh. And yeah. then this one yeah. an increased too. Yes, it increased. Yeah. Look at you. Yeah. Okay. What other sacrifices you felt like you made during this time as well? So again, once I got into that industry, for me that was like everything. It's just been you know, uh, as far as sacrificing, knowing that y- we have a term in radio. It's called uh, those for those that love it. They're called radio rats. Radio rats. Because you know how rats, they're always there? Yeah, like gym rats. Yeah, and all the like other, gym rats. Terms, so we're called radio thing. rats. So mm-hmm. so once I was in that business, I was always at the radio station. Even when I wasn't supposed to be, I was either at school or at the radio station. So your friends become the people at the radio station. Yeah. Everything is about that world. So you kind of, do, it's not even feeling like a sacrifice, but you sacrifice 
you know, maybe doing other things with other people. Yeah, but then you always mention, especially on people that are coming up on radio, is that preparation is key. That's it. When you it have to. to it. So even if you were getting up and acquainting yourself with the rest, you were still most likely prepping for. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's also like it's a it's an industry where everybody knows each other. So right. you have to have that networking and that that stuff. So more of the sacrifices came after uh, when I got married and had children, that's where more of the sacrifices came in. And really, they're the ones that made a sacrifice because mom was always working. Mom was always gone. Mom was always at events. Mom was always, you know what I mean? So my husband and my children, either they would come with me and they grew up in it. If I could bring them, I would bring them to the radio station. If I could bring them, I'd bring them to the events. But I remember, here's, here's one story, an example. I had just... Uh, gotten a job at a radio station uh, doing a morning show here. It was the first female to to do head a morning show and then first Latina. And what the, radio station was it? It was Kick FM 991. Mm-hmm. So then they told me I had just had my daughter. I had just come back from maternity to leave after 12 weeks. And then they said, hey, next week you're going to go to the Super Bowl. You're going to cover the Super Bowl with your team. You guys are going to wow. get to be on Radio Row. Are you serious? And you guys are going to get to be live there for a whole week in Phoenix. It was when see, uh, uh, the uh, it was when the Cowboys were playing um, the, Cowboys uh, were the Steelers. Steelers. Pittsburgh yes. Steelers. Yes. Yep. And it was in Arizona. And, you know, I was like. I just had a baby. I can't leave. But I couldn't say no. It was part of my job, right? And so that was a sacrifice to have to leave my baby so young. And when I did the morning show, the morning show starts at 5 in the morning. Mm. I used And the station was in Dallas right off 35. I was living in Grand Prairie. I would have to wake up at 3 in the morning, shower, leave my house by 4, get there by 4.30, be on the air. So all those morning things that you do with your kids, like breakfast and take them to school. Them to school. Yard, but they were little. They were yeah. little. But I'm saying I didn't get – I had to have a nanny live with me to help me with all that because my husband would go to work. Oh, yeah. So I my kids sacrificed a lot of time with mom. Mm. And, and so that was a huge sacrifice for them. And to this day, they're still sacrificing. That's why you see – I have to incorporate them in my life. If right. not, I'd probably never really see them. Yeah. Was there anything – like guilt wise or anything like because I know that was part of what you needed to do because I know that's your passion. That's right. when you felt like you know what you were placed here on earth to do so. Right. Any kind of guilt at all whatsoever? If so, always. how do you deal with oh, it? Oh, always. I would sometimes be driving to work crying, mm-hmm. you know, because it's like you're torn. Absolutely. You're torn between two, you know, but you're wanting to provide the best that you can for your children. And then in hindsight, would I have done anything different? I always say I'm a person that lives with no regrets mm-hmm. but one. And that was the one that I think I wish I would have. Um, when I had my kids, I was in the industry. So right after my maternity leave, I'd have to come back because you're under a contract. Oh, yeah. I wish that I would have taken probably the first five years of their life and been with them and then gone back to work. Uh, but this is kind of an industry where if you're off that long. They forget you. Yeah, they forget you. Wait and me. so it's very hard to get back in. Mm-hmm. So it was a risky situation. But I think. I shouldn't have been afraid because if that's your purpose and your calling, just like God put all those other opportunities, he would have made that happen anyway. Mm -hmm. So that is really my only regret regret in life. And then one of the biggest feel that is sacrifice that you're done. And that, you know, you needed to do in order to continue to do what you needed to do. Right. To provide also for your family. Yeah, to provide. Because put money, uh, food on the table. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah and, and a good live education. Yeah. Anything they needed yeah. To. So they grew up in a, you know, a nice house. They had all the things. But a lot of times I think those first five years are so crucial. Mm-hmm. And um, they say, I asked them, did it affect you? No, oh, they don't know. We're good. You know, like they don't say yeah. anything. But it's probably more me, my own personal like guilt, like thinking. I think it's things that you've probably looked into because from what i heard identity of a child becomes from the time they're born to seven years old Uh to get their personality yes and during those times you feel like it's crucial to be there for the same reason that you're trying to mold them into things they're going to be right yes and you'll later see years later if that's true or not because you know you might want to want them to act a certain way, but they might be acting differently. Right. And then that takes you back to like, oh, was, was yeah. it that part? Was that it I that? Made? Did I do that? Yeah. Should I, if I would have done this, would they have this? Yeah. yeah. So you, I think, I think moms 
no matter what, mm-hmm. we always have those things. Yeah. Because let's say that I've heard moms that stay, do stay home and they sacrifice that. Then they go, you know, maybe if I would have went, went to work, I would have been able to provide better for them. And they wouldn't. You know what I mean? So it's, you can't win as a can't mom. Can't win. You cannot win as a mom. <laughs> can't so win you can't all win as a mom, period. So, but you know. I think something important you told me before, because I think I asked you before, what if this happened? What if that would have happened? And we always forget that this is the way that it should have happened exactly. and needed to happen this exactly. way. There's no reason to look back and this and that is over. It's already, yes. this is the way it needed to be. This is the way it went. But I also that. think a part of that too is moms is like, you. The, it flies, right? You look up and they're already adults and mm-hmm. you say, oh man, I wish I would have had more time with them as babies. You yeah. know what I mean? Because you look up and the time, it flies. That is true too. And, I, and that you can't get back. And you but, can't get back time. But... However, I think it's some significant that they are doing, they're alive. Yes. They're being productive humans in society. Yes. They're doing whatever they need to. And they are living. Yes. Again, well, with I their own them. families. Right. I'll, I'll ask them. I'll go, did it affect you that I work so much? And they were like, mm-hmm. no, no. You know, so as long as they're yeah. good. Okay. It's okay. my own personal mom guilt. So. You know, and you know, I never thought about how moms, even after the fact that you, you gave birth, you fed them, <laughs> and still to this day, raising your kid never, even never going done. back to trying to think, how can I have done it better? Yes. It's never over. Yes. And that's crazy to me. Yes. And I appreciate my mom, and I appreciate you as a mom that, that, well, we, because we love our did. children so yeah. much, and yeah. we want to make sure that we did everything we could, right, to, yeah. to make them productive, kind yeah, I don't, I don't, citizens. I think we don't give you enough credit as far as moms. Yeah. And, and, and uh, even if you want to <laughs> picture, imagine, kind of capturing words, trying to see, it just, just can never. That's the reason why Mother's Day is one of the biggest holidays because we can never put it into words, not like things, material things to provide you to, to see how important it is, yes. the role that you play. Yes. So, okay, what about the third question that you wish I would ask you? of the times that you've been interviewed before. So I think a third, and again, it goes back to my family is I think I, some, they never ask like how important is it for the person that you're married to, mm-hmm. or let's say you're dating. Cause mm-hmm. before I was married, I was dating or whatever. How important is that other significant other? How important is it that they support you in your Probably any dream, but radio especially has a high percentage rate. When you look at radio and television, media people has a high percentage rate of divorces. Okay, let has me ask a you high something. percentage because they sacrifice a lot too. Mm-hmm. And no one's ever asked me like, how important is that? That when you are in this industry, that you are with somebody, whether you're dating or married, that is going to be very supportive of what is required for you to be successful well, in this industry. Let me ask something personal. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt because. If I'm not mistaken, and I don't know if you're okay with talking, you, yeah, you I'm divorced okay. I'm, before. I'm open. Yes, I was. So if that happened because of the same no, thing? No, no, no. And that's a good thing. I've been married twice, mm-hmm. and both of them were very supportive of my mm-hmm. industry and career. I don't think I could have probably been with someone, you know, because anyone that I did date that wasn't supportive, we broke up. I mean, yeah. It was, just didn't work. But that's why a lot of times there's a lot of breakups, there's a lot of divorces, because it's a lot of time required away. And you're going to events, you know, oh, I got to go to the Super Bowl for a week. And oh, who are you going with? Oh, I'm going with the sports guy, the news guy. The, and it's all guys. It's all and, guys. Yeah. So as a female, even though the percentage rate is high divorce in males and females, I mean, again, you know, your your husband has to be very confident. They have to have a lot of trust in you because, oh, I got to go to this remote. Where's it at? Oh, it's at the club. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I'm going, I got, got to go. You know, now they can come with you, yeah. but after a while it gets old for them, you know? Yeah. So they're like, I don't want to go, you know? So they have to trust you. And so you're out there with people. You're meeting so many people. And so let's talk about our Latino community. Our Latino men mm. tend to be, they say, a little bit more macho, <laughs> right? And they're a little bit more protective and they're a little bit more, you know what I mean? Jealous, you Jealous, could say. Jealous, you could mm-hmm. say. So Again, that is an important thing to say, you know, is this Latino man that I'm going to be with? Because both my husbands were Latinos. Mm -hmm. Are they going to be that kind of man that is not a macho man that is going to give me the freedom to have the wings to do what I need to do? Right. So, so because if you have that stress and that conflict of where are you going, who are you going with, what time are you going to be home, you can't go and freely do your mm-hmm. job right, no, not you at know. All. And so that causes a lot of problems. Or so it's going to reflect in your work. It's well. going to reflect in your work. It's going to reflect. So I'm blessed that again, 
Uh, that was never the case for me. But nobody's ever asked me that because they also have to sacrifice Absolutely. too. They also have to sacrifice. Absolutely. And have you ever had a conversation about that? That as far as like, has it even came up as a conversation that like any kind of conflict about that at all for either husband? No, no. Everything's been. I think the very, it's, this is kind of funny. <laughs> when I met my husband now, Miguel, I was in the industry. I was working at K104 at the time. Mm -hmm. So he knew me. He's known me in the industry. That's all he's known. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and Miguel, I knew because I met him, I knew him in high school. I knew his family. I knew how he was, is a very confident person. So I knew there would never be an issue. He's not going to be a jealous guy. He's not going to be possessive. He's right. not going to be. So I didn't even have to worry about that. But it's so funny that for the first time in all those years, this year, year 12 of Fishbowl, mm. He made one comment one time not too long ago because I said, you know what? I got I to gotta start changing my hours. I'm going to get off at 7 every day. <laughs> and I think one day I got home at 9 and he goes, hey, I thought you were going to get off at 7. And I said, well, I couldn't. Cause you did it. Well, look, here I am Friday. It's going to be 8. I apologize, Mr. Miguel, Miguel Martinez. Yeah. That's totally but, my fault. I do apologize. Next time I do see you, uh, if. I next drink on me. Yeah, but 100%. no. But I'm it, sorry. But it, but he never he never asked yeah. me what time are you gonna be home. What time? There was times. I mean, I'd be here till eleven till we could. Lots of times. You know, yeah. there's times I'd be here till two in the morning when I was starting this business or three. Oh yeah. And so it's so funny because he would never say anything. He would never complain. He was always supportive. But that uh, not too long ago he goes somebody what somebody here made me mad. A client made me mad, and I went home and I was like this client blah 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 blah. And I said that's it. I'm done. And he goes yeah because you've given 12 years to them now it's my turn mm -hmm. like and i was like huh like he's never said anything mm -hmm. about that you yeah. know what i mean and it was cute i thought it was cute interesting yeah interesting. it was it was interesting okay so in 89 when you got here there was a, a certain way demographic everything that was functioning at that time especially with the latino was different right compared to what it is now right the global latin factor i felt like it's something that's been happening for years, generations to, to come and generations that had happened and to come as far as the things that we have contributed. So from 89 to now, I call it the global Latin factor because everything's connected now globally, whether we want it or not. Markets, Internet, everything, social media. Have you seen that impact as far as what I'm referring to the global Latin factor from 89 to this year to, to 2021? Yeah, I mean, it just keeps getting greater mm -hmm. and greater and greater. You know, when you look at it on a spiritual standpoint, we truly are connected. We yes. we are supposed to feel like, even though we might not be related by blood, we're still one because whatever affects me in the world is eventually going to affect you. Yeah. So on a spiritual level, it's always been and should be that, that we're thinking of not just ourselves, but the whole, right? How everything, because everything's a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. What I do doesn't just affect me. It affects my family, which then affects my neighborhood, which then affects my community, which then affects my state, which then affects the nation, and so on and so on and so on. So we have to be intentional about our words, intentional about the things we're doing, because it's a ripple effect. But definitely since the onset of Internet, when it's so easy to connect with everybody and people, right, mm -hmm. it's made things even more tangible for people, I think. To be able to feel that connection. Okay. So tell me about Fishbowl. I know if I'm not mistaken, it was a vision that was given to you at one time. And that's how it took place. And yes. And that's how it came to be. Can you tell me and elaborate a little bit more about that? Oh, wow. So I'm really excited because I'm going to do a shameless plug. Even though we're, <laughs> so, even though we're sold out, uh, our shark, our 12 year, every year we do a Sharky Awards, right? Yes. And as a matter of fact, your videographer, Carlos, mm -hmm. he's the one that always would put our presentation together. But he's gotten so big and so busy Carlos. that he can do ours this year. It's a cut. It's a new Yeah. Head like, you know, he just doesn't have time for fish bowl no more so i had to get somebody else but today i saw the final version that we're going to get to see it's the first time we're kind of trying to do something out of the box mm -hmm. we wanted to do a documentary of the company for the last 12 years and nice. within that the awards show so it was kind of an idea i had and i said well let's just try it let's see what happens it's going to be at the cinemark theater in grand prairie it's going to be next saturday it's red carpet we are sold out but i got to see the uh final version today and mm -hmm. look it had me in tears and it was really great because it's kind of tells the story of of from when we started to to now and um it's been it's been interesting to see you know without spoiling it 
can you tell me just a little bit about what would they expect, like the history? Of- well, yeah, they're going to hear how did I come up with the idea. They're mm-hmm. going to hear about the different uh, people that have gone through the network. They're going to hear about uh, the different challenges we've had and then so all, all the good things that I've had. So, yeah. And it's pretty funny. It's not funny, but it's interesting because we most of the times when we at the awards, some of yes. those things are discussed. But now some of the hosts are going to be able to see it in, in a picture right. form as to the stories that we've been telling. You've been telling for years. So it's yes. like your first, very first client. Yes. Like Candyman. Candyman, yeah. Candyman to all the other people. Right, because sometimes you might be a client that just started a show last week. Mm-hmm. And you come in and Fishbowl to you is what you see right now. You didn't get to see everything that me and Candyman, our very first client, and someone like Dee Dee Ingram mm-hmm. or Keith Hall or some of these foundational shows, oh, uh, yeah. Rick McNeely, have seen. They've seen it. They've been here the 12 years. So they've seen every transition, every evolution, every change, the good, the bad, the ugly. And But most of the hosts haven't. It's from the point they come in, that's what they see. So in their mind, that's where it started. Yeah. But no, it really started. Way back when, right? Yeah. You, you never was there a moment in time that you felt like it wasn't going to work at those times that were really, really difficult? I just never... like that six-month period that you just about to break, <laughs> and they just pushed a little bit harder. I never felt it wasn't going to work from the day that first client came in, Candy, because I knew if one would want this, others would want it. And I've never felt that. What I did feel and do feel sometimes is like, I can't do this anymore because I'm getting older. It's a lot, you know, and that's just any entrepreneur, any business. It requires a lot. Like what we do, and and again, your videographer, he's been here on the day-to-day-to-day-to-day operations. He understands all the different elements that come into play. Mm -hmm. Our hosts come in once a week, do a show, they leave, right? They don't see all the behind the scenes of everything that goes on to make everything happen, right? So there's a lot of moving parts to it. And so it's a lot of work. It's time-consuming. It's very... uh, you know, changing all the time. It's radio, it's media, it's fast pace. It's, uh, you know, juggling 20, 30 things at a time. But so there hasn't been times where I never thought it wasn't going to work. I knew it was going to work from that first customer. It has been working. What I have said is, I don't think I can do this anymore. Me, Sammy, like I'm tired. I'm getting tired. I'm getting older. I'm mm-hmm. getting tired. Um, and so, yeah. Okay. So with that said, you know what happens? They said, I don't know if it's true or not because that haven't happened to me yet. But shortly after people are retired, right, is the end of the rope for them. They don't really. What do you mean? They die. Oh, they die. No, shortly never... after. No, I'm no, just no. saying, like, if you. Because right now, I understand where you're coming from. No, but get... wait. Okay. I got an answer for okay. that. Okay. Look, if you invite me on your show, I'm going to be a mic hog because, you know, like, <laughs> so a bass, that's what do I you. do. do you. So here's the thing, Crispin it's how you perceive retirement. The way I see retirement, it doesn't mean to stop. Mm -hmm. If you look at the word, it's retire. That means take the tires off and put some new ones on. Mm -hmm. So when I retire Mm -hmm. from fishbowl, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop. I'm taking off those tires off my plate, but I'm going to put some new tires on the car because there's a lot of things on my bucket list that I need to finish doing. I have a book I'm writing that I got to finish. I still love public speaking. I'm still going to do that. I love voiceover. I'm still going to do that. So I'm always going to be working. You know what I'm saying? I'm just going to have more time to do some of these other things that I want to do in my life. Travel, spend more time with my aging parents, spend more time with my grandchildren, finish that book. You know, so I don't think my personality is one. My dad always says, your mom, you and your brother, you don't stop. You don't know how to sit down. Mm -hmm. And he says, me and your two sisters, we're chill. Right. But my mom, me and my brother, we're just like, that's who we are since we were little, you know, like, like that we're just like those people that get, yeah. you know, no podemos parar. Even at home, when you have a break, we're up. You can ask my kids, man, my mom wakes up and she starts cleaning and she's like, this. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's my mom. Yeah, they're like, sit down, watch a movie. And I'm like, you know, the most I can watch is maybe one movie. But after I get everything done, then I can sit down and relax and get it done. We always at, at my mom for the same reason. She's always cleaning and never, yeah. never stop. And like, <laughs> lady, sit down, Like, mom. sit down, yes. And they're like, sit down, watch a movie. And I go, I will when all this is done. And then yeah. I can sit down and enjoy it. And then I'll watch one movie and they're like, let's binge watch. And I'm like, no, that's a waste of time. Binge watch. I got stuff to do. You know what I mean? So I think 
the only time that I can sit still is when I get sick. And I think God has really, like the last two years for me, I've been, a lot of my health issues have happened. I did get COVID in December. I had the long haulers effect. I have fibromyalgia, these allergies. I mean, God has sat me down. He has sat me down because I'm not yeah. going to sit down on my own. <laughs> but you do need that recovery time, yes. you know? We, yes. we, we do our, need our batteries recharged with unplugging yourself from everything that you're I doing. I know. You know. It's hard And for... sometimes we don't want to do it. There's other forces that will make us That's do it. That's it. And that's what happened to me. And so I now I've the... realized that. Like, I've got to just slow my pace down. Okay. Tell me about the book. Is this the book something like a biography of yourself? Oh, no, or no. What is it no. about? So I have a couple of books. One mm-hmm. of them is just, and it's actually being edited right now. It's actually just kind of like, have you ever seen those books where it's like a little thought each day? Mm-hmm. Uh, on my Facebook, I have hashtag Sammy G thoughts. Mm-hmm. And so I've compiled the best of those. And that's going to be a little book. Okay? okay. It's called hashtag Sammy G thoughts. All right. So that one's. So it's getting edited, edited, so it's real It's, it's soon, close. yes. Okay. Then my next one, it's called Spaghetti, uh, Throw Spaghetti on the Wall. And so... Oh, so make it stick. Yeah, make or don't. Or you know don't. what I mean? So, mm. And the Throw Spaghetti on the Wall, the reason I wrote that book is because that's been my mode of operation of how I have done my life. Okay, so uh, you throw it. I'm if it sticks, good. If it doesn't stick, it's not ready yet. But I'm not afraid. Ah. But you to still keep trying and changing. Yeah. Like if I have an idea, I go with it. Let's mm-hmm. like for instance, hey, this Sharkies, let's make a movie. What do you mean make a movie, Sammy? It's a war. Let's do the, let's throw it on the wall. Now this for, you know, it might work, it might not work. People may like it, people may not, but the vision was created. And then let's say they love it. Now we can improve on it and tweak on it and continue to make it better and better. Not only that, but it's going to be everlasting because That's it's it. a documentary and it's a movie yeah. and it could probably go a, a bigger than it. I right. mean, I know it's within, but there's right. other. But like, I don't wait like to that. make everything perfect uh, to start. And Carla knows that. Like, I'm just like, let's do it. Let's go. Let's do it. That's why my slogan for my company is jump in because that's how I am. I'm a jump in. Let's try it. Let's go. Let's do throw spaghetti. Let's see what works. Let's see. And if it doesn't, oh, well, now we learned that it didn't. Or maybe it wasn't ready. Or wasn't ready. And we got to cook it some more. And then later throw it again. Yeah. And Mm. so that's what that's how I do my life. So that's why it's the title of the book. I like that. Yeah. And then number three. And so then my number third one is more, it has nothing to do with like fiction or nonfiction. It's more of an educational book for radio broadcasters. Mm -hmm. So how to program their shows, right? And it's, it's kind of goes in, in, in hand in hand with my. Uh, masterclass that I teach online. It's called the Behind the Mic Masterclass. It's uh, six weeks of how to program your show, how to brand and market it, and how to monetize it. But I'm going to put it in book form for people that might not want to take the masterclass that would rather read it. Okay, so here's my thought on that part. And it's more maybe, of an educational maybe book. Maybe you can answer me that. You were one of the first internet radio stations to exist that I'm aware yes. of. There's been other ones. I know one guy, the original guy that began to do the podcasting part. He kind of, so I don't remember his name, but the actual station or the concept of an internet radio station, I feel like you were the first one to come up with. Yeah, we were the first to do it. When I researched it, uh, when the idea came to me, I researched it and uh, the only thing I found out there was a station in Los Angeles that was in an office that had two offices mm-hmm. and it was a table that had the mics and every single one of the shows was talk show. Talk show. None of them were music incorporated. None of them because you have to pay music licensing fees. Was you it more to... like a podcast vibe type? No, it was live. It was, it was live. live. It was live. Uh, and so that was it, but it was, everyone was talk show. Well, mm-hmm. I had come from the world of where you play music and right. So okay. I was like, no, I want to do like a, you know, I want shows. If they want to play music, I want them to play music. If they want to do talk, they can do talk, but if they want to, you know what I'm saying? I wanted yeah. to have that aspect. So we were the first to, to do that with the music, right. Mm-hmm. And to offer the music licensing. Um, and then also, like I said, their facility was just literally an office with, a table and some things. It wasn't like what we had created at the first, more of a station feel, right? More of a station feel. So nothing had been done like that before. Okay. So with that being said, and the book that you're getting at the third one, do you Uh think it's still something relevant because terrestrial radio is not really what it is anymore? Even though most likely, like remember FM was here for a while until AM was here until FM took over. Right. And then now it's slowly, it's still probably going to be here for a long time. Right. But do you think, 
the things that you're doing is still going to be relevant for, let's say, 20, 30 years from now? Yeah, because what I'm doing is talking about, I'm not talking about terrestrial radio. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about digital radio and podcasting. I'm okay. talking about internet radio okay. and podcasting. What I what I teach now is what we do, we're doing now. Correct. But see, a lot of people, here's the problem is when you get an FM and A in radio, like the world I, I come from, they're hiring you from your air check, your professional, you know, you've done it. Podcasting and internet radio, everyday people are getting into it. Yeah. They're doing it, but they haven't been trained like a professional how to do it, how to program it, how to monetize it, how to brand and market it the way we do in FM and AM. You see what I'm saying? Because yeah. at the end of the day, it's all content. Mm -hmm. It's all content. Yep. AM, it's all content. It's just the vehicle we're using to push it out. But still, the principles of how to do a correct radio show in terms of to get listeners, to grow listeners, to monetize it, that is is the same across the board because it's all content, yeah, but how yeah. do you do it? So there's so many people doing podcasts, thousands and thousands and, and internet shows now, <laughs> and, but they've never been trained. They just get on the mic and they just start talking, but yeah. they don't understand how to do it correctly. Yeah. And it's all a communication too, effective communication. Yes. Like you said, content. Yes. But there's also strategy involved. Oh yeah. There's a lot of strategy involved. There's a lot of psychology involved of the listeners. There's a lot of things that unless they have been there, done that, worked with a mentor themselves, you know, understood it, uh, have degrees in it, then they're not going to get taught that. Yeah. So I think it'll be relevant. I th I, yeah. yeah. And I, I look forward to it. I'll yes. get a copy. Of yes. all of them. Yes, of thank you. So whenever right. you have them This ready, is on tape, right? Yes, this is the, he's going to buy my video. books. I'm going to buy my word. I'm going to get his cup. I'm going to buy my word. You know I'm going to buy my I word. I am. And you know, also, I, do, I also want to say that I was talking about the Sharky yeah. Awards. Yeah. Well, Crispin was our show of the year, which is the highest award. Well, the highest award is the, ele the Legacy Award. I've only given that to... to uh, one other person this year, someone else is going to earn it. But I've only given that to two people in 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the next award that is yearly, that's the highest award, is the show of the year. Yep. And Crispin is a recipient of that award in 2015. 2015. 2015. So, 15 16. so yeah. I was I very proud it. of you when you came in and you did an amazing job for us. And yep. I love what you're doing here, which, to be honest with you, I love this show way better than the, the show you did meaning the concept yes because i think it's more i, I appreciate the compliment i was one of the, the, the first latino uh, shows la, by a latino that won you're the that, only that, that, latino that has won the it. only one and i felt like this was more so i'm always been part of a group of things or mm -hmm. part of a movement of somebody yes and nothing that was mine right and i need feel right until i have to just separate myself from it and do my own thing and i felt it was important for the same reason when i mentioned in the beginning is that a lot of latinos sometimes we we forgot certain things that we contribute in the world so like many chocolate things. Um, tortilla corn potatoes all that is literally at this moment feeding the world and all those came from the area of the Latin Americas and all that. That's right. Know? And if we don't have anything now that you can go back and look, because a lot of the times the books don't, like current education and the curriculum doesn't have that information. Well, and I hate to say it, in Texas they just passed a law while we mm. were sleeping where all of that is going to be taken out. Anything that are any small part that exists of teaching about other cultures like that, they're removing. So we really need outlets like yours, like this yeah. show where people can go back and, 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 and hear the wonderful things that our culture is doing. Yeah. Cacao, chocolate, you know, it's funny. Everything started from the Americas, took, took, into, uh, taken to Europe and then right back to the United States. Right. So it's okay if they pass all those laws because unfortunately they got the internet, they got fishbowl, they got the places that you can express yourself. Uh, the library places, education <laughs> yeah. that now you can do for yourself yes. so even if i was i don't have any kids but if i was to have kids i would let them explore things that they can learn more yes outside of whatever they have in school because now i feel like in school all they teach you is how to take a test yes and i don't think there's the way and that's what i was going to tell you latino parents really have to get behind their children to help them reach their dreams because when people ask me sammy how did you accomplish the things you accomplished in your sports, in your career, in, in this? And I have to go back to, of course, first and foremost, God. Yeah. But the, I was, I was, I, every day I say, thank you, God, for 
making me the child of these two individuals mm -hmm. who had forward thinking, these two Latino parents that were so ahead of their time, I think, uh, that they were able to encourage us in the way they, they did, support us in the way they did, help us and put us at a young age, right, in those places that would help us hone our skill. Yeah. Even if it wasn't at the school that had, had a program, they were going to find a place that we could hone our skills. You see what I mean? Yeah, I know, so, and it's very important. It's I think so, it's super it's important. It's so huge that more Latino parents really get involved in that way. Yeah, I think so. I know it's 100% factual what you're yes. saying, and I think that, it's a big problem in the Latino community yes. that we don't do that yes. to get behind. Just Okay, so maybe we think about, oh, it takes money and this and that. No, just as little kids telling them that they're able to do whatever they want right. to. Plant that seed that they're limitless, that they can go and pursue whatever. Yes. And the, at minimum, give them that. And then later on, it's self, it will play out. Self-development, you know? yes. Even by yourself. Without, let's say they were able to find the finances to get you whatever, but minimum they gave you that mentality. Exactly. The mentality that you were able to do whatever you needed yes. to, you know, and I felt that's how you discover, which I feel like even though you love radio, I think communication and all that was mostly your first love as far as what you right. wanted to do. Right. Exactly. I think, it's, I think it's awesome. So yeah. you are right. I think you're hundred percent right that we, but look, it doesn't even have to cost money because there's a library that's free that you get a library card. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, my parents' mindset came from the books that they read mm -hmm. and those can be found in a library. Absolutely. So reading motivational books, yeah, getting off the TV. Yes. Watch TV a little bit, but you know, take the time to read some of these motivational, uh, self-help, these, uh, great people, because that's where the mindset comes in. Yeah. You know, Pitbull, uh, the rapper, Pitbull, yes. he said his mom used to drive him to or wherever school, or whatever. And he always have Tony Robin tapes playing. That's it. Always, always. Yes. And he always like, what is, I don't want to listen to this. But in the back, he was subconsciously always getting wired. Seed. Yes. Now he's working with the guy. That's it. You know? And that and was my dad. That. My dad had Zig Ziglar. These were friends of his because that's what he did in his life. He was in sales. So a lot of the, and he wrote manuals and sales stuff for State Farm, which is a huge company, oh, yeah. global company. So he was, you know, motivating and so he was in that world. So a lot of these guys that you hear, Zig Ziglar, OG Mandino, these were people that were coming over to eat at my house or be oh, wow, you know, with really? my dad. Yeah. So I grew up with the, I can, I'll even bring you one day, remind me, I have, before there was CDs and before there was digital, there was records, right? There yeah. was vinyl. Those motivational tapes that you hear, they were on records. And my dad would be playing them. And so, you yeah. know, you're a little girl sitting there playing with your Barbies, but that's getting into your head. And, and subconscious mind. And then when he would read a book that was like motivational, inspiring, he would give it to us to read. Mm -hmm. So so it's, it's put into your mindset. It's yeah. put into your brain early on. Yeah. And if you can get that kind of socialization into more children, and especially in our community, in our Latino community, man, you know, yeah, I think we still need work. I think we have come long a long way from just being a regular worker to being lawyers, to being business owners, entrepreneurs, to different things. But we still have a lot of work to do for the same thing that you can't just go to work. And then go home and then party in the weekends and then do it all <laughs> over again. And right. yes, of course, take your children to church and teach them about God. But again, to expand their mind yes. and, and be more than that, because it's going to be a cycle and it's going to be the same thing over That's and it. over again. If you don't really take them, listen even to motivational speak instead of watching a novella. Watch a couple of motivational videos. Right. Of speeches of people that really move. Yeah. Move and those you. are free. You yeah, can down, go to YouTube. They're free. They're go to free. the library. The books are free. Yeah. You know, so there's ways. It just takes effort. It does. It takes effort. But those efforts will pay off with your children. And then, you know, the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. Yeah. Because if you don't leave them anything else, let's say you leave them that much and that sense that they can... Go for more and do and anything. That drive, yes, that's like priceless compared to leaving them. Of course, wealth is good and not right. having an inheritance. But right. If you don't have that for whatever reason, you weren't able to get the finances. It's actually to, better. I yeah. was reading. I don't know if you watch CNN, but Anderson Cooper. Yes. He makes twelve million dollars a year just on CNN, not the other stuff he does. Oh, yeah. Right. And they asked him because he just adopted a baby uh, not too long ago, and they asked him, you know, are you, you going to leave a lot to him? And he goes, no. No, I'm not going to leave him anything. I will pay for his school. That's it. And he, and then his mother was Gloria Vanderbilt, who came from 
the Vanderbilt family, family, which is one of the top, you know, mega riches. And mega then she rich. made her own wealth. But guess what? That's how they trained her. Like, we ain't gonna, just because you come from the Vanderbilts, we're not going to give you nothing. You go out and make your own stuff. We'll pay for school. You go out. And she did. She went to design school and Gloria Vanderbilt Pride, and she created her own wealth. She, and they said, because if we leave it to, he said, if my mom would have left me all this money, the Vander, you know, he you said, Anderson's Cooper. No, he said, what drive would I have had yeah. to become who I am now at CNN, this journalist, this famous? I wouldn't have had no drive because it would have been given to me. Well, not only that, but whenever they give you something that is not yours and there's no effort behind it, yeah. you don't treat it well. Right. You, there's no work behind it. There's no sacrifice. And statistically, they lose it within two generations. It's like, it's like winning the lottery. You don't yes. have the, the education to know how to handle it. But you hear well. people like Bill Gates mm -hmm. say that, that they're not leaving big in here. They'll pay for education. But people get mad. Oh, but they're like, who are they to opinion on somebody else's money that right. they made with their sacrifice and what they want yes. to do to educate their children? Yes. You know? Yes. I don't know. My husband says, if I was that rich, I'd give it to my kids. Like he's so, he's yeah. like, he wants to, you know, and I'm I like, well, I'd give some probably more than what they're saying. But at the same time, I agree with that philosophy that, you know, they're not going to, uh, appreciate it yeah, as much they're yeah. not gonna there's no effort behind there's no it. There's effort like, behind it yeah they give you anything and then before you know it, you just throw it away like a toy yes. like every toy yes. just to the, throw it to the side and yes it's gone so a lot of those guys that's why they give a lot to charities and yeah. organizations to help the world to make the world a better place to, to do that because if they give it all to their kids their kids will probably squander it and then the, their kids might not become Somebody as great as them. Yeah, Jackie Chan's going to be. A lot of wealthy people, they're well off. And mm -hmm. I, I see the philosophy behind it. I see why they would want to do it. Because, yes. again, like you said, if it's no effort, no drive, no drive to become anything more than you just laying there, yes. whatever they do doing. Do the media. work. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so before I let you go, I do appreciate your Thank time. You. I think that I succeeded in asking you a few things that never been and you're going to be on TV, by the way. So oh, I am. Maybe, maybe 40 years later on YouTube, you finally oh, made it on TV. Oh, wow. Think about that. Yeah, that'll took, be fun. And I'm going to be next Saturday on the big screen at the Cinemark okay. Theater. Hey, <laughs> we're going to get this out before it. However, I oh, appreciate wow. the time. Yes, and thank you for having me. Congratulations on the 12 years. Thank what you. are one final thought that you will want to give to anybody, whether it's Latino or anybody getting into radio or anybody that has a dream that's just hesitant to go for it? What would you say? So I always say my quote that I end my show with. Mm -hmm. I have a show here called The Interview. Or it's also a quote that I end my speeches with when I go public speaking. It's my favorite quote. I didn't write it. And it's unknown. I don't know who did because when I looked it up, it says unknown. Mm -hmm. But if I could get a tattoo on my back, I might. But it's no one is you and that is your power. No one is you and that is your power. I told you that before. You didn't tell I me that. I told you this before. No, no, no. Yes. This was, I've had this for years. I, I said that before to you. I remember or we had a conversation. He's trying about to take it. credit. I'm not trying to take credit for that quote. But I remember you and I having a discussion about it. No, I think I told you that that's my favorite quote when we were having a discussion. I gave a speech a long time ago. I don't think I even knew you at that time. Because where I, I found this was online a long time ago. I'm and, not doubting that. And it I'm said saying, unknown. And I was like, dang. And I was researching the unknown. And I was like, somebody had to you know, write this. Okay. But, so if anybody knows who actually wrote it, because I believe in giving credit to Absolutely. the actual writer. But yeah, if I, would, if I leave my shows like that. I leave my speeches like that. Anytime I have an audience, I let them know that no one is you. And that is your power. Don't try to be somebody else. Be authentically you. You have everything inside of you to be great. Okay, I'm not trying to take credit for the quote, but what I'm trying to tell you is that oh, Lord, it's so crazy me to me that I had that I had said that same quote before, and I don't think I picked it up from you, but it's crazy to me that I have the same quote that I said before on a speech be, uh, at a previous time. I think it's Toastmasters class that I was doing, and wow. I did something like that because I told them the story about you know how a little bit of my story, how I got here and this and that. Right. And that's how I ended it with. And that's why we're going to come full circle of how we started the show. Yeah. We're, we're one. Yeah. I think that's so. That's why you have the same quote because we're really one. Whatever it is, whatever psyche, whatever <laughs> unexplained <laughs> energy that we all have said, <laughs> we had, <laughs> we had <laughs> saying the same quote. It's trippy to me. <laughs> it wasn't that I was trying to say creative. Like I said that before, 
Like I didn't hear you. I didn't hear it from you. I don't believe I heard it from you. But I swear I say exactly the same. Because I say it a lot, and I mm-hmm. post it a lot, and yeah. I talk about it a lot. But yeah, well, it might have been that I might have read. It might have been that I might have read it somewhere. Great minds think alike. But it's it's crazy to me that I've used it before, and I'm like, and I'm here, and I'm like, what? Is Great this? minds think alike. All right, what? Well, okay, so let's do one more thing. Because wait, you said one more the last time. Well, I know, but you know how this goes. Two year short goal, five year. Long go. I never do that. I never answer that Why question that? when people ask me because I don't even know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. Good. So do I journal? I journal a lot since I was little. I journal and I journal my dreams, what I hope to accomplish, but I never put a date to it. Mm-hmm. I never put a date to it because I'm not going to even be here tomorrow. So I do visualize it and I do verbalize it and I do write it. And then I start doing the action to do it. But I never put like, oh, in two years, I hope to be da da da. In two, I might not even make it to lunch tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So I don't like to put a date to things in that sense. Right. Uh, as far as goals, I have dreams, I have bucket lists, but there's never a date. So you do have goals without a due date, but they have you have for sure written goals. I- I have, there's certain things that in business you have to have a due date because there's deadlines. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in those kinds of things like that, but Mm -hmm. I'm talking about like, where will you be in two years? Where will your company be in five years? Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't even ever think I was going to even have a company like Fishbowl. And I'm someone that writes my goals and sets goals and does things. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that was never in any of my journals. Like, oh, I want to own an internet radio network one day. Like that was never on there. And here I am 12 years into this. I never thought we'd be sitting right here in Choctaw Park Stadium for even, you know, like I, I don't, that's not how I work. That's not how I work. And the mortality part, the fact that you realize that we're not here forever. No. Well, where did that come more of? Because a lot of people don't take, they don't really ponder that question, that uh-huh. fact that we could go tomorrow and it's a fact. That's part of life. It's like, a, a, you know, that if you're born a, uh, what is it called? A, uh, a caterpillar, you mm-hmm. know, that eventually you're going to become a butterfly. Like that's how you were designed. Mm-hmm. So God designed us to live here on earth and have an end date and then move on. You know, this is just a phase. Mm-hmm. So we're going to move on to that next chapter. And yeah, like going to happen to all of us we just don't know how or when we know the caterpillar we've studied it we see it in a book and there's a couple of people that claim they died and came back and all that we can read those books to see what is similar a lot of them have similar experiences like you see this light you see this wow right so there's a lot enough of a commonality that you go okay maybe it's like that but i mean mortality is not anything to be afraid of it's part of just like you got to go to, you know, just like you got to be a baby and then you got to be old and then you got to be, you know, young or whatever. Yeah. We're all going to transition. Well, the reason why I ask is because I wake up most of the time, pretty much every day, and there's a guy that I usually listen to. And uh, it's something that I say every morning. And I said it before here that says, I'm not immortal. I am mortal and I will die one day. Yes. And not to scare me, but to realize my mortality and to realize that we're not here for a long time. And well, our physical body is yes. not is not immortal. We'll, we'll, we'll go. Our physical yes. body is not immortal, no. but our spiritual being is immortal, in my opinion. In my opinion. Yes. That is my belief. I th- okay. So we can get into that f- in a different, like, yes, yes, you're believing whatever you believe. Because but- we're all, ener- everything is energy and we're all energy. There's even energy in this mat here. If you looked in a microscope, you'd see little things moving. They do destroy so, atoms. Yeah. You know that, right? So we are, we are all energy. Mm-hmm. So energy it continues. It changes form. It it's changes kind of, like an ice cube can get yeah. melted into water, but it's still, if you look in the microscope, it still has those components in it. Yes. So. I just believe we're energy and I believe we're just going to change form. I believe that, but there's a, the a collider in Switzerland. They actually have been able to destroy atoms mm-hmm. to pulverize them to mm-hmm. nothing. So energy has been, but we're evaporated. beyond, but we're beyond atoms. Remember, yeah, I don't think we really know exactly how we're, we are. We're, so we're, more we're, it's that it's the Holy, it, we're spirit. It's yeah. that Holy spirit. So that's just that's my opinion. True. It so. is. And to I, I feel, I don't know. Is your opinion? Yes. I don't know. Yes. I don't. I know. Have more questions than answers, but my opinion would be like whatever you believe in is whatever is going to happen whenever we leave this physical yes. body. Whatever it is that you have, the last thought, whether you're going to heaven or whatever is where you're going to end up with. Whether it's that's it, the end of the line, where everything goes dark, where you go into another body, whether you go into heaven, whatever. 
that just was going to happen. Like your last final belief is just wherever you go. Oh, interesting. And I don't I'm know. A, yeah, I'm but that's a, that that's a whole other show. That's a whole other show. It is. What happens after death show? It is. And Coming that to you at a <laughs> Fishbowl Radio Network studio. And Perfect it time during Halloween season to know. <laughs> when we talked about the Yorona. We talked about different things. And it's like a perfect La Chupacabra. <laughs> Yes. I appreciate it. Again, one more toast. Yes. Appreciate it. Many more years to come. Whatever years Thank that you, you do. I appreciate the time, the impromptu, the professionalism to being able to get here. I felt like I got material and answers from you that never been provided to the radio or video. Right. And I appreciate it. Well, I'm looking forward to looking back and seeing this. I'll so send make it to sure you. you send me the link. You'll links. be the first one to get it. Thank you. I guarantee it. Again, this is the Global Latin Factor Podcast. Remember, we're just like you. We are the spice in this melting global pot, melting pot that it is the world. Until next time.